So many people want to be a game designer because they have great ideas. So today we're going to showcase the difference between idea and implementation. We're looking at five games that had a great concept and not so great a game. Gaming history is paved by the victors, both the big budget success and the surprise underdogs that changed the game. But for every game that hit its mark and found its audience, we have hundreds, even thousands, that never did. Whether a good idea poorly implemented, or a fantastic game that just never found its market, decades of gaming have fallen into obscurity. Here on Gaming Unearthed, we'll uncover the past, one forgotten pixel at a time. Picture this. A team-based fighting game where you level up, unlock magical artifacts, recruit new party members, and balance the team to let them recover and heal between fights. Add in the deep lore of an existing IP with beloved characters? That's right. Picture it. <sighs> Iron and Blood's core gameplay is probably the worst fighting game I've ever played. Horrible, horrible camera. Wonky controls, barely functional animations, zero balance, and pretty much as bad as it looks. But this crap right here has the foundation of a large-scale RPG mode five years before Soul Calibur came along with its Weapon Master mode. The campaign doesn't have you selecting a fighter, but the entire side of good or evil. You'll build a team out of your side's champions, and you win by defeating the enemy forces with a few unique twists. Each fight will net you experience points that lets you level up. Artifacts can be unlocked that give you unique abilities, and your spells can be upgraded up to three times. If your hero is defeated, he loses any artifacts he's carrying. And if he runs out of lives, he's permanently dead. Before each battle, there'll be a stated objective. Match objective, new teammate. Which is a reward that your team will get if you win this battle. This is how you upgrade your magic power or you find artifacts or you recruit new heroes. Surprisingly, this adds a layer of strategy about which characters do I want to send after each objective. Can I afford to lose a ring of resurrection to the other team or should I send my damaged high power fighter? It's funny, I return to this game pretty often and every time I'm immediately reminded how bad it is. But after 20 minutes, I find myself enjoying, despite the quality. God, this game needs a functional remake. Up front, I do want to say I really like this next game. I'm the ideal audience for it. I've beat it four times, and it's how I learned I could read lips. Let's start off with a quote from the developers about their intentions. The Quiet Man was an experimental game that tried to explore what would life be like if you didn't have words. The protagonist is deaf, and the developers were testing what does this mean to players. The gameplay is often wrongly compared to something like Streets of Rage or Final Fight, but it has much more in common with an ultra-low budget of the Arkham games. You don't trade blows with enemies, but you're actively trying to never get hit. But you can't blame people for being confused because this game's choice to cast aside words goes unreasonably far beyond deafness. The settings menu is all abstract iconography and I don't want to tell you how long it took for me to realize what that focus button meant. There's no UI and you need to rely on blurry colors and vibration on the controller and these emotional overlaid cutscenes to Combine this confusion with this god-awful choice to apply a sound filter to everything to make it sound like you're underwater all the time? I seriously thought this was a bug. I thought something was broken. <laughs> the first playthrough is the silent mode, and it was three hours of torture. Video games already remove our sense of touch and taste and smell. But games do need to be a constant feedback loop. The game needs to teach me how to play, tell me whether I'm doing good or bad, or how my health is. This game fails on that front. 
No, it completely and utterly tries not to succeed for artistic reasons. This was a mistake. What this game really needed was to learn from silent movies. They shouldn't have removed the sound, but replaced it with meaningful sound cues that informed the player. The audio should be reinforcing the story they're trying to tell, even if there are no spoken words. But as it is, I'm one of very few people that can actually enjoy this game, and that's really sad. You are an elite military unit tasked with eliminating a vampire outbreak. You can use stealth, surprise, and high-tech weapons like the UV knife. How can you possibly screw this up? By making the player climb that ladder, shimmy across that ledge, slowly crawl along here, climb up here, drop down there, whoops, you got spotted, you're dead. Players, just find the right linear path to win. Rather than focus on the military and weapon aspect of the game, Artoon decided to mimic the early Splinter Cell games. Instead of combat, it's slow-paced navigation and sneaking. But good stealth is often about interesting movement patterns and being able to hide and recover when things go wrong. Vampire Rain is full of static enemies that'll immediately kill you. Sure, they give you weapons to fight back, but the vast majority are useless unless the level is specifically designed to give you time to fire two or three entire clips. So in practice, the shotgun's ammo becomes another puzzle tool. Where do you have to spend it to open up paths to get to the end of the level? Really, the ultimate feeling of Vampire Rain is that it's one of those old choose-your-own-adventure books. Do you take the left path or do you take the right path? Choose the wrong path and you die. But unlike those books, you generally need to redo sections of them, slowly crawling, inching across this ledge, climbing across this pipe, and just searching for that one correct path. Overall, Vampire Rain isn't anywhere near the worst games I've played. It's absolutely functional, it has a good game loop you can follow, and there is some fun to be had. But with such a great concept, it's just underwhelming. Yeah, this one doesn't need any special build-up or explanation. All I'll say is that I'm really not looking for games that were disappointing because they were sequels or made by a good dev, but specifically games that sounded great on paper. Mass Effect Andromeda would be a good example because they added exploration features, a jetpack, and a new universe. And it really had the chance to bring new life to the series. And then, you know. Get this. An online fight league where you design a fighter and you brawl with other players. Win your matches to earn money and improve your stats while risking permanent injuries that can force you into retirement. All this concept needs is a semi-competent fighting game engine to be absolutely amazing. And Fight Club doesn't even do that. Despite 10 playable characters and custom creation, you only pick between 3 static fighting styles. So instead of 10 fighters plus creator, you have 3 fighters. The combat depth runs out in an hour. Look. Even SmackDown 2 was released four years earlier than this. Def Jam Fight for New York came out in the same year. We've seen great fighter creation, and these systems were not unknown by this era. Fight Club just didn't do it. This lack of depth gets even worse when you realize that the single player is an entirely separate, linear experience. No training your fighter, no risks from injuries, all of these unique ideas just thrown out the window while you fight a handful of matches for a fake plot. Playing the single player, there's not even an indication of the freeform multiplayer experience. And with zero online fan base, you're doomed to be stuck in that terrible solo mode. The problem here is that everything just feels unfinished and unfleshed out. This feels like a pitch prototype you give to a publisher so that they'll give you the money to actually make a game. The sad part is that this core concept really wasn't even explored again for a long time. 
the first similar one that I can think of is EA's UFC 4 in 2020. Modern fighters still have a proven desire for an online social experience, but permanence is something that I would love to see more developers attempt. The problem with Superman is that his core design goes against everything we know about games and storytelling. How do you build tension and create challenges when he's invincible and has super strength? Comics and movies solve this by making Superman a protector. It's the people around Superman that become targets of hostile intent. We all know that Superman can and will win, but can he save everybody along the way? And this was the clever design choice that EA Tiburon came up with in Superman Returns. Rather than a life bar, you have a Metropolis health meter. It's reduced when property is damaged or civilians are injured. You can restore it by delivering injured people to the hospitals. This moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is genuinely engaging, and when you reach that mindset of throwing yourself in front of giant death beams to protect innocent people, you feel like Superman. And the flying? My god, I've been playing this game for years and I'm still in awe every time I play. But all of this is overshadowed by the metagame progression, or more accurately, the complete lack of it. It feels like they ran out of dev time in implementing the story and emergency events, and in a desperate attempt to ship on time, they tied progression to your experience level. Just imagine playing Final Fantasy without the world map or the storyline. Fight random battles, and when you reach level 5, you fight Garland. The princess was kidnapped is not a deep plot, but it's enough to give meaning to these random battles. Superman Returns is literally just filling an experience meter. This is mildly okay early on when you need to win 4 battles to gain a level, but late game where you have to win 50 battles of the same 10 enemy combinations that you've been fighting for the past 8 hours? Not so much. I return to this one regularly and it's always the same. There's always the learning curve of reverse Dark Souls where you're trying to get hit by everything. There's the joy of flying around and experimenting with powers. And then the joy runs out and you're stuck with this awful, boring grind and disappointment because it was so, so close to good. But it is hard to stay mad at the devs when you know a little bit about them. EA Tiburon is known by a different name that you're probably more familiar with. EA Sports. It's in the game. This studio is primarily known for creating sports games and Superman Returns is slightly outside their comfort zone. This was a highly ambitious project, and considering their skill set, it's no surprise that they didn't quite pull it off. Yeah, they failed, but honestly, this was a pretty good effort. One of the universal truths about game development is that it's really, really hard, and that everything can go wrong. First up, we've got the money and the time budget. It's not unusual to cut features and rework systems to compensate for those changes. But we also have to consider things like IP restrictions or legal restrictions or just management in general because developers need to answer to people above them. And sometimes a good idea just turns out to be trash when you actually sit down and play it. So what can you do to minimize the risk of this happening with your own games? The biggest key is that you need to focus on finding the fun early. Prototype to prove that an idea works. Prioritize develop in the order of functionality, fun, and then you get fancy. Because you've already found the fun, you can safely cut early, often, and focus on the polish.